You're listening to XS Manchester. I'm Clint Boone. I'm joined in the uh, studio today by a young chap who, an uh, old friend of mine, um, not only one of the most iconic guitarists of all time, but a man who's uh, recently proven to the world what a great singer he is, what a great songwriter he is, and a great frontman, uh, Mr. Johnny Marr. Welcome to uh, XS. For, nice to see you again, Clint. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Look, you're looking good. I feel all right. You are the uh, yeah. Peter Pan of Manchester, aren't you? Okay. Yeah, it's all. All smoke and mirrors, a lot of smoke, yeah, and quite a lot of mirrors as well. Now, I think of it, Peter Panchester. We could do something with that, couldn't we? <laughs> Should we do that, Peter Panchester? Yeah, <laughs> no, maybe not. First things first, how are the dogs? Oh, riff, riff, and, riff and buzz, very good. Riff, yeah. well, I went out with buzz this morning, riff's knocking on a little bit, it's a little bit hot for, for riff at the moment, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I've got two Rhodesian Ridgebacks, and uh, at the moment, I came back from tour the other day, and I kind of feel like they're treating me like their butler. The dogs. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. You know, with the hot weather and everything, it's like yeah. I serve them up some water and then I'm trying to do my stuff, and it's like this water's not cold enough. Is it? Is their body language like where have you been and all that? So <laughs> is it on them? Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in this hot weather as well, they're like, they, oh god, they want flipping ice cubes in it next. Yeah. Yeah, but they're they're, they're, they're okay. Yeah. It's good to have. Uh, yeah, it's good to have animals knocking around. I think I like it. I think it's all to do with. A life form that's not a human being, isn't it? It's like humans are great, but it's great to have. We, we're surrounded. We've got rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, a lizard, fish, a dog. We've got a dog now as well. I know. I saw your dog, yeah. yeah. You sent me a little, a little movie of it. What's it called? Dolly? Dolly, it's a little girl. Oh, you Dolly. sweetheart, yeah. <laughs> we're swapping films with each other. <laughs> but the funny thing is, I had, I had Sean Ryder in a few weeks ago, and the first thing he wanted to talk about was his dog, uh, Malcolm the Beagle, five-month-old beagle that he's in love with. It's his baby. Yeah, Brilliant. I know. So no, it's... it's, it's uh, now it's good for you when you come off. Uh, yeah, it just sort of grounds you. I think. Yeah. When you know, if you, especially if you're out touring and everything, you then you have to sort of go and take the dog for a walk. It's really good for you. And uh, you know what? I actually saw um, uh, Alex Capranos from Franz Ferdinand talking about this very thing recently. He said that um, they had a dog in the studio when they're making the new album, and he was saying that what he noticed about is that the dog is in the studio. First off, he noticed that the dog wasn't bored because the dog's a pack animal. Yeah. And and really like being in the in in the studio, like a band member. Yeah. And then he, but interestingly enough, he said that um, dogs will, will what they do when they meet you, unless it's a vicious dog, it, they'll lay down on the back and they'll be like, "Look, I'm vulnerable." They'll show you the vulnerability yeah. and just be like, "Look, I've got no ego going on." And he actually thought that was actually the best band member he's ever been with. Yeah, because you could probably do. <laughs> yeah. That's probably a good lesson to most creative people. That's that. Book. Go in there and just be like, "Hey, listen, okay, yeah. I've yeah. got no ego going. I lay on my back, scratch my belly, like a session man." That's <laughs> <laughs> session dog, isn't it? I could think of a few a uh, few band members who could do that that lesson. Lay, yeah. lay down there on the floor, and there's your there's your water. Yeah. Give them a little bit of a scratch every oh, now and again. On belly. Can I tell you a funny dog story before we get oh, back to talk about the all important? No, new I'll just album. stay talking about dogs. So it, it, this is a story, a true story. Uh, pets at home in Stockport. My wife was in there the other week and one of the staff told her this story about people getting there with dogs and it's a bit of a social event for dogs. They all go meet in each other. Oh, yeah. in, in the shop, obviously. It's a big uh, pet supply place in Stockport. This dog was running around loose and um, eventually somebody made an announcement. Can the owner of the, uh, whatever it was, um, Alsatian, whatever, it's some sort of little dog. I don't know. It wasn't Alsatian. Can the owner of such a dog please come and pick it up and you know look after it and that? Anyway, there was no response. So somebody said, Let, let's see if it's microchipped, find out who, who it belongs to, and can, you know, make an announcement. Will Mr. Watch whatever come for your dog? They microchipped it, found out where it lived, got the phone number of the owner, phoned the owner and said, Your dog's um, running around our shop here. And this woman says, No, it's not. It's in his bedroom upstairs, it's in the bedroom. And they said, No, it's in the shop here running about. And the woman said, I'll go and check it. It's upstairs, I'll tell you. Look. And then she went up, no dog, came back down. So the dog had escaped from the house, ran three miles to this pet shop, knowing that that's where he has a lot of fun with his mates that he sees and gets a lot of attention that. So that's a proper rebellious teenage... He's acting basically like a like a teenage rock and roll fan, that dog. Yeah. That's like the yeah. way I used to act when yeah. I was like 15, just escape, run for three miles, go to see Slaughter and the dogs or something. And then go back home with your tail yeah. between your legs. <laughs> Where have you been? Where have you been? <laughs> That's, that's one rock and roll hound. Isn't it? It's great. But anyway, it went three miles apparently. And, uh, but you do, whenever you see a dog walking down the road, they always look like they know where they're going, don't they? Do you know what I mean? Like, cats don't, know. the cats are just like wandering about. Oh, but dogs always look focused. Don't get me started. Anyone who's read my book will know that me and cats are not a good combination. You're not, you're not a cat man, are you? Nah, they, they hate me. Right. They, they just, just really, let's just leave it at that. Okay. I'm intrigued though. <laughs> we'll come back to that another time. Let's talk about this amazing new album then. So it's... Um, 
The first thing that struck me about it, it's your third solo album. Yeah. And you can totally tell it's a band album. It's Johnny Marr's record, obviously, but it's it sounds totally like a band rather than right. one geezer surrounding himself with cool machines and gadgets and just noodling yeah. about. It's a band, isn't it? Just from, yeah. from note one. Yeah. Um, a bit of that is because the music's a bit darker, I think, and a bit more rocky. You know, uh, the bass... I mean, my band, you know, uh, most people know now, I mean, I've got a really great, great band and we've, we've been together about seven years now, but that sort of sound, um, I, I sort of deliberately, after about five songs, to be honest, Clint, I sort of identified a few things that were going on in the record. I didn't know when I went into it, mm. which is unlike me. I didn't know, I had no idea what I was going to do, frankly. And about, got to about song six and I was like, all oh, right, it's sounding very it's sounding darker and, and a bit more industrial and um and i'm right okay therefore i shall continue doing that yeah you know what i mean i was like all right this is what's going on and i got the direction i didn't go oh we need a dancey one or which you know sometimes you know you sort of think along those lines or oh, we need a we need an acoustic one or wouldn't it be great to i was like no 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 i'm making making a rock record and then i kind of um so i hadn't written the song the traces yet which was the first single and that's a good example of what you're talking about because it's really all around the bass that mm -hmm. that song and and the drums i guess and um we met my singing on the top and the guitar is almost like just fits on top of everybody else so um um what happened with that was i was like okay what is this album all right yeah i really like the direction it's going in and i wrote the traces as a kind of uh, signpost really to sort of pull it all together lyrically as well yeah and and the band just really let cut loose on that i mean ewan and jack are outrageous on it really yeah jack's doing this amazing tom stuff so yeah and we kind of know uh, i think the band felt very liberated on all the other guys as well now because you know they're my band are, they know they're my band they've been yeah. my guys for seven years now it's great yeah it's, it's got a different sort of sonic texture than the previous albums, definitely. Yeah. And like you said about it being dark, I, I thought elements of it were as dark as people like Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson. Yeah, good. Do you know what I mean? That's like yeah. really And the, the old mood of the album is dark. It's not a joyous album, this, is it? No, it's more, but it's dramatic. Um, and the reason being the short version is that I actually was probably feeling that way uh, when I went in, you know. I really, when I went in the studio, as I say, I didn't know what I was... I didn't have a plan about what I was going to do, but, but I, I just knew that I really needed to make music. You know that feeling? Yeah. It's like, you know, like you did when you were 15, 16, for whatever reason, I, I just really need to do it because I'd not uh, been on stage for about a year, not with my own band. I'd done stuff with Hans Zimmer, but me and my band hadn't played a gig for about 18 months and, and I'd been doing the book and frankly, you, the promotion for the book, I, I was proud of the book that as I am, I found it quite intrusive. The, yeah. the mainstream media I found it intrusive, you know, being on Newsnight and and Channel 4 News and all of that. Uh, but I, only because, that sounds a little wussy, but it was because, you know, I hadn't had any time to process it. I'd gone straight from the book to being in these, like, glaring headlights. Yeah. And although I appear like a very, you know, calm and collected, confident person, it sort of, uh, it took it out of me, that. And, um... So I was just like, you know what, uh, I need to, the way I need to sort of not fix myself but feel better is to go make some tracks. Yeah. And uh, and, I, and I think that's why it sounds the way it does. It's quite, I was feeling quite emotional, I think. So you went into the studio without any song ideas and did you, did you put them I, together while you were Yeah, I had, I had one song which was, uh, I had Spiral Cities uh, and I knew it was, too good to just put as an extra track or a B-side Spiral Cities because we played it a lot live. But I went in the studio and was doing, I was like, luckily I was quite prolific because uh, the night before I'd go I'd go and get an idea and play it on guitar and, and onto my phone and then I'd go in and Dovey, I could be sitting there, he's like, what have you got? And I was like, okay, I've got this, I think it's a song. <laughs> and then the first few just hit the bullseye. Yeah. But I think uh, Hi Hello was one of the first ones and... Um, and day in day out, and then New Dominions. Uh, when I started like messing around with a drum machine, putting through pedals and everything, so it was a process of uh, uh, coming at the studio with a rough idea, writing it in the studio, demoing it, then getting the band in a couple of days later and going right one, two, three, four, bang. Wow! So it was, yeah, you enjoyed work, working that way. Um, Ra rather than writing the stuff at home and 
as I said, assembling it and then getting something to replace. Oh the yeah, balance. yeah, it's well better playing. Yeah, it's way way better playing. With, but it was hard, you know. I'm, when I think back now, um, it, I was in a sort of uh, quite a. Uh, I wasn't in a. I was in a sort of suspended. I, I didn't really know what was what was going on really because the the world had changed in the last couple of years with Brexit and and Trump and yeah. everything. <clears throat> um, uh, and the Manchester thing as well, obviously, that, well, that had I mean, left a shadow over it. Well, that happened while I was recording A Different Gun, which, you mm. know, was, and that song is about, was, was, was inspired by the Bastille Day Nice attack. Yeah. And, you know, when we, and I was, I was recording A Different Gun when, when it, when the Manchester attack happened. So a couple of lines um, from A Different Gun were directly because of the, well, 48 hours of the Manchester attack, the line staying, which is the main line, uh, stay and come out tonight was my friend Kevin Drew from Broken Social Scene. They arrived the night of the, the night it happened. Yeah. And the next day that Kevin was sending me all these, I mean, these amazing little clips of my city um, and people, people doing the most amazing things, singing and laying wreaths and all of that. And he was sending me them throughout the day and I was going, listen, I can't come and play tonight. I just can't do it. He's listen, you've got to, You've got to do it. Yeah. So that's a whole other story, but uh, yeah, that. So I had it was a, it was um. But the feeling of say that song and the feeling of a different go, um, of um, walking to the sea, which uh, are emotional songs, I think are a very hopeful. That's what I was doing. The very this you know walking to the sea is literally it's uh, a a story of me going down to a beach and clambering over the cliffs to throw myself in the sea with the hope, <clears throat> living on hope, that I will come out of out of it as a different person. And the, the main line in that is been hope breaks on me. So it was turning, I think, my natural sort of idealism, you know, the way I'm sort of, I don't know about optimistic, but an idealistic person, you know, I was turning it into music really and, and same with a different gun, you know, it being about celebrating the hope, really, yeah. rather, rather than just getting down in the dumps about things. That's the whole spirit of the album that I get is that mood of, um, as a, as a civilization, we're perched on the edge of oblivion almost, in an apocalyptic way, but like in the way that a boy would have made an album about that. But there's always that sense of we will rise from this. Yeah, that's why, well, that's why the first song is called Rise, you know, it's exactly for that reason. And um, the, the, um, I wrote this very stirring track with Rise. You, well, you know how it goes. Like sometimes you you have an instrumental track and you've got to put the lyrics on top of it and, and appropriate singing. And then other times you start like with the traces. I had the title and I wrote the music around that. That's one of the really enjoyable things about having this band and having my solo career. That I can I can have an idea for a song like the traces and I go, well, what is that? Yeah. Make make a song that sounds like that. Whereas in the past with Morrissey or Matt Johnson or whatever, I'd write an instrumental track and then they'd sing on top of it. So I can write any different way now. But with the, with Rise, um, I this as I say, it was very stirring, and um, I thought, oh, okay, well the singing's got to be really stirring, and if yeah. the singing's stirring, the lyrics have got to be stirring. Yeah. And um, and then I had that opening line, um, it now here they come, it's the dawn of the dogs, they they hound, they howl, they never let up which is directly comes from the American election. And I thought, that's a good way to start an album. It's like the manifesto, <laughs> isn't it? I, I thought as soon as I heard it, because I, I, I sat down and listened to the album as a whole thing, I've, I've heard the singles obviously, but when I heard that opening line, it's like it just sets the tone for the yeah. entire album, doesn't it? Like, well, like great albums should do, the first line should say, this is what this is all about. Well, for the longest time, you know, my role in all the bands that I've been in was, was uh, you know, I was obviously the guitar player and I wrote the music saying the Smiths, but... Um, you know, now if I come up with a line that I think is going to um, be a good opener for the album, it's a lyrical decision I've made. Yeah. Whereas before I was always like, <clears throat> no, you can't start the album with that riff. It's, it can't start with an acoustic or it yeah. can't start with a piano. We're a guitar band. Well, now it's important, uh, it? it's important that, you know, the, the lyrics are important to me. What I'm saying yeah. is important. It's, it's like, like it's like once upon a time in it. It's like the equivalent of that. It's like this is what this story is all about. Yeah, that's a good title. You know, on the, the to me, the other manifesto track is Walk Into The Sea because that is, I think it's beautiful. It really captures the spirit. If I was to say to anybody to listen to one track to give you a flavour yeah. of the album, it'd be that. 
and the video for it as well, it just shows the band at the coolest. It got, it's like Velvet Underground, isn't it? Yeah, we the, did that in one take, and then the main the main take, in total there's two takes. We did, we just filmed the band rehearsing, and we put these projections, my son started putting these projections against us, I mean, and um, and then we just shot another one to do close-ups of guitar. It was just done at like in 25 minutes, that video, which yeah. is kind of cool. That, it's spot on, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Proper, uh, and it's a great song as well, great track. Um, Let's go back a long time to um, that generation of music that changed both of our lives quite substantially. I'm talking about punk rock. And when that arrived in uh, Manchester, it was 1976, so you were four years younger than me, probably 13 maybe. Can you remember how that affected you? I know you're already into music anyway, but yeah. to me, the punk symbolised a vehicle that was great for people of my generation and limited musical ability. Did it affect you the same way? Um, it affected me in... in I saw that, like everybody, I saw that um, in the Buzzcocks, uh, I saw that I could do it, you know, um, and Spiral Scratch was, people won't realise how shocking that record was now. Oh yeah, to technically. Figure, honestly, yeah. to, to, and to the cover, for example, I think, I'm, I think I'm right in saying that 76, Hotel California was out then, Every, yeah. everything was like, Slick. Everything was slick and really LA and mm. all of that, and, and it was all that old sort of paradigm. And then you've got that. And then also for me as a guitar player, my next big jump was seeing Marquee e. Moon, the television Oof. album cover as well. I mean, yeah. aside from the amazing music on it, yeah. but it was a Xerox. I mean, back then Xerox machines were like really modern, and I'd never seen a cover with a distorted picture like that. Yeah. So the message is that the because Spar Spiral Scratch, I, I did know that. Um, it was four lads freezing cold on the steps of uh, a statue in Piccadilly Gardens. That's right. And you're like, you look at these people who are like, you know, you, you could bump into in Virgin Records or whatever, and you're thinking, not only have they actually made a record, uh, which up until then was seemed like, you know, an impossible thing, but it's actually cooler than all these really expensive yeah. slick things. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was so liberating, and it's from Manchester. Yeah. So... I mean, truth be told, I was quite surprised when Nevermind the Bollocks came out because it sounded so layered and I, I wasn't expecting it to sound quite... I mean, it's an amazing record, but I really loved Spiral Scratch. I thought it was great. And then the next big thing for me was uh, um, Shot by Both Sides by yeah. magazine. Yeah. And again, it just how it happened to be in my hometown. Yeah. So that was the, mess the main message that it sent out to me, like, whoa, hang on a minute. Mancunians can do it and then the Buzzcocks running with the ball like that and they were on the top of the pops all the time and, and they were always the best band on top of the pops they were like, like our Beatles weren't they oh man <laughs> all those songs was just so great and yeah. um, and I was just like oh okay they're on a major label so Mancunian bands can do it that that yeah. was just amazing for me yeah tell us that anecdote about it. obviously you lived in the shadow of, or you grew up in the shadow of the Apollo didn't you yeah, um, and during the punk era, and you started going to gigs uh, illicitly because you're probably underage or couldn't afford it. Yeah. Whatever. we used to uh, have a secret way getting in, <laughs> didn't you? Which you probably uh, do. You ever still use that method now? Tell uh, us about it. I t it's um, well, there's a, a drain pipe uh, outside the girls' toilets of the of the Apollo, and um, so what we used to do, we used to uh, you'd, you'd see a few girls, and um, that was another good thing about punk gigs because. Uh, because more girls went to see punk. Yeah, they did, yeah. Up until that, it was Blue Oyster Cult and Barclay James Harvest and all that, and girls would, there was a girl-free zone, though, <laughs> quite rightly, and um, not a very good sign. But so we'd, you know, me and my mate had asked um, ask one of the girls, like, listen, you know, uh, will, you, will, will you open the window, that little window up there? And then, and then when the support band had come on, one of us, usually me, would have to climb up this... Uh, this drain pipe and squeeze into this tiny, tiny little window. And as you were getting in, there'd be usually quite a few shrieks and screams from, <laughs> like, from coming inside the girls' toilets. And then you just leg it and then you you run all down this labyrinth of stairs, and then in, which is in the backstage area, yeah. right? I now have discovered. And then um, it, to this doorway and then you'd open the doors and your mates would pile in. Yeah. And, um, but I, you know what though? Have you seen how high that window is? I've seen it, yeah, because you told me about it before. It's, uh, it's well high. Shocking, shocking. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but the thing, you know, the things you do for, for rock and roll. Yeah, free, uh, yeah, free. I'll tell you what, we, 
I probably shouldn't say this. I'll tell it now and then. If it sounds bad, I can cut it out. But early on, when the Inspiral started and we started hanging out together, before we made records, our guitarist, Graham, he worked at a printing company. So, and back then, tickets for gigs were printed on paper with a, a number on. And we used to, like, copy the tickets and make forgery just for ourselves, not to get, not to sell, but we used to get in with forged and tickets. And it worked. It worked, yeah. Because there was no, like, watermarks or, you know what I mean, barcodes. It was just, like, a piece of paper with the, you know, the Ramones written on so, it. Or whatever. You'd... <laughs> You know what I mean? It worked though. Spelt wrong. I might, I might actually, yeah, yeah. I might actually take that out. Um, no, I like that. I, I like that. I think that's great. You yeah. Know, why not? You and know. It's like you said before. It's that rebellious uh, rock and roll, that focus rock and roller, isn't it? Wanting to get out well, on that journey. I mean, you know, just to complete the picture. You're on a, you're on a, but you're on it. Ross. Yeah, but what you know, what used to happen it was that um, you know a bunch of lads usually. I, I don't remember any girls being involved. Used to congregate behind. Um, Behind those doors at the Apollo, and definitely uh, at um, at the Free Trade Hall, because that was the only way you could get in the Free Trade Hall around the back. And um, no matter who was on, uh, I'm not alone in saying this. I used to go and see, and whoever was on, I would go and see. It didn't matter. I saw so many bands that I just, you know, don't care for. Yeah. And um, and loads of other other lads did the same. It was a really great pastime, and you know, you get to sort of it was you know often freezing cold and it was in november and stuff like that but we always got in one way or other by hook or by crook i never yeah. walked away from one of those gigs never getting in and i saw so many bad groups <laughs> <laughs> um you know but um it was uh it was a really exciting part of life and uh you know whereas some kids now maybe you know they go out hang out in skate parks uh I, I used to go and hang out around the back of gigs my point being it didn't really matter what what the band was yeah you know, it was just being part of that. That was a great, a kind of a great sort of way to hang out, really. Yeah, and a big inspiration on what was to come next. Sure, anyway. yeah. Let's talk about a, a chap that um, I'm familiar with, with who he was, but a, a, a bloke that you met before the Smiths even, um, when you were selling clothes at X Clothes. Um, the, the, it was the era of boutiques. We used to say, we used to be able to use words like boutique, didn't we then? Like, like lads Boutiques like are hotels now, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, but back then it was like, what, what, you do, what my dad had said, what are you doing? Off to Manchester, we're just going to check out some boutiques, looking for clothes. It was clothes shops for men and women, wasn't it? But yeah. um, Marco Polo was one of my favourites. Ex clothes where you used to work. Uh, but around that time, you met a chap um, in the clothing trade who went on to have a massive influence on your your career, right up to you know recent years. He passed away two and a half years ago. Obviously, talk about Joe Moss. It's a chap that the man in the street probably won't be generally aware of. But yeah, uh, tell us about Joe Moss. Well, Joe was a very interesting character. Um, Joe had, um, he'd made a, a life for himself during the 60s in, in and around Manchester. Um, he started off with a stall on, um, on some market, which uh, I think I'll, that used to be the underground market off Market, off, uh, market Street. Yeah. He started off like making hippie sandals and stuff like that. And then that expanded. He was involved in the eighth day, which is still there now. And then people from the 70s will know of his shops, which were called Crazy Face. And as you said, you know, bo the boutique culture in the 70s and, and then into the 80s when I first met Joe, early 80s, was um, it was quite a unique kind of cultural thing, really. They were very important, those shops, uh, and Crazy Face was one of them. So mm. Joe had built up this uh, this three shops. They were all named after Van Morrison songs. Crazy Face is one, Cheap Hello Honey is another one, and I can't remember what the third one was. But anyway, when I met him, uh, I was 17 and I was working on chapel walks in town um, where the Grinch is now. And um, he had a crazy face shop next door. And um, I used to nip in there for a cig. Um, and the girls in there were they were great. They were good fun and they were, you know, they were, they were good to hang out with. So I used to go in there and um, the shop had what now you you call retro culture so the shop had loads of old pictures of james dean and marlon brando and marilyn monroe and all these old 60s movie stars which then was really unusual and it was super hip yeah. really, because cds weren't even out then yeah. and um so this culture of reappropriating the 50s and all of that what well, hadn't was just about to start happening so joe uh i used to go into the shop and i'd yet to meet joe he's hanging out with the girls in there i'd say why, what's this music? John Lee Hooker and Solomon Burke and all of this, Van Morrison. And oh, Joe makes us listen to it. So I'd, I was intrigued to meet this guy, Joe. Anyway, I walked in there one day and uh, on my lunch break and um, I saw this guy 
who would have been in his mid to late thirties, and who looked his whole image was. If anyone who's seen um, Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he looked exactly like that. And he would have been about thirty-seven or something, which to me was ancient. <laughs> 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 and um, and um, uh, I stuck my hand out and said, "Oh, you know, my name's Johnny. I'm a frustrated musician." And we got into this conversation uh, about playing guitar and all of that. And um, he he then from that moment on, he became like a sort of father figure to me, a mentor. Basically, I would then run over every lunchtime. I would then run over from Chapel Walks, where my shop was, over to his warehouse, his building, which was um, is on was on Portland Street, where the Beaujolais Wine Bar. I don't, I think, I don't think it's still called that now. But anyway, near Chinatown, I would run over there, and I'd go and hang out with this my new mate who was in his say mid to late thirties, and he just was like, "Oh, you've never heard John Lee Hooker." Oh, you ever heard this little Richard B side? Oh, I'll tell you where the door, the door's got that from. I'll tell you where the birds got that from. And I was just like, this, I was like a sponge, just kind of crazy. I just soaked all of this stuff up. Mm. And he was my new best mate. It was unusual. And this was a guy who, um, so he had, his own, he had his own building. He had a few shops and, um, you know, he had children and, you know, it was amazing. So it was, a, for me, it was a cross between having, not a boss, but it's suddenly like, yeah, just like your boss is suddenly your best mate. You yeah, because anyway. he had a lot of time for you. That's as important as any of that. He had all this time for this. Well, the thing about Joe yeah. as well, I mean, obviously I could go on, we could make a whole whole programme about Joe Moss, but um, over the years, you know, then he, he then he encouraged me to form the Smiths. So it's me and Angie, my, my now wife, my girlfriend and Joe. That's how the Smiths started. Right. And then he sat me down and showed me a documentary about the songwriters Lieber and Stella where one of them went to knock on the door of the other one. And he, he said, watch this bit. And he just put that idea in my mind. Yeah. So that's where I got the idea to go knock on Morris's door. So he helped me get the band together. And then the thing about him is that, and the, and as you pointed out, I mean, Joe was my manager up, right up, up until the night he died, which is in 2015, after our very last gig of the tour. Wow. Yeah, he, he hung on there to the very last gig. Yeah. So my new studio is called the Crazy Face Factory in tribute to Joe. And um, and it also is because it, it looks a little bit like where the Smiths first started out. So yeah. I'm reminded of that. But the, the, the good coda to this about Joe Moss is that I meet people all around the world. I meet people in San Francisco and they go, oh, I used to know Joe. I meet people particularly in Japan Mm. Because he then he mar- he went on and managed that band Marion and he, and then managed Haven, all around dotted around the world are people who used to email and text and write to Joe who were in their teens and wanted to be a photographer or they wanted to start off a clothing label or they wanted to be a painter, and he had that same relationship with everybody. He used to he would take young talent and nurture it and. Um, so there's all these people dotted all over the world who've, who've always expressed to me this amazing debt of gratitude they have yeah. to Joe Moss because yeah. they know I, I'm kind of the embodiment of it in a way Yeah, because he stayed as my manager up until he died. But yeah, um, yeah t- t- there's, a, there's, a, there's a documentary in there somewhere. Yeah, definitely. And without him, the bottom line is without him, there wouldn't have been the Smiths. Oh, no, with no chance. Mm, no, he, man- he was our manager and helped us get everything going, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the um, amazing collaborations you've done. You mentioned Anne Zimmer before. You did some work with him, which is phenomenal. Uh, you did something really unusual with Maxine Peet recently. Yeah. Oh, brilliant again. Yeah, well, the, the thing with Maxine was that it came... All my ideas are really always... Uh, they're never put together by a manager or by um, a record company. They're all these just these notions that I have. And um, what happened with Maxine was that I wanted to... In visualize or envisage a different kind of guitar music that I could do alongside Call the Comet, and that isn't about verses and choruses. And so I had the idea, this feeling, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty good. And it kept coming back to me. And then the once I decided I wanted to do it, within seconds, I just imagine Maxine Pete talking over it, right? Because I'm a massive fan. Who isn't? Yeah. And um, and. Um, we got to meet, I didn't know her at that point, we got to meet 
and we just met up and had lunch and we were chatting about this, that and the other, all kinds of stuff. And then at the end of this meeting, I said, oh, I've got a bit of a, con- I've got a confession, you know, to make. I've got this idea about in the future about doing this project. Yeah. And I'd love for you to do a track with me, you know, and she was on board. She was like straight away, like, you know, and then this friendship developed and, um, and it, I just got her to um, say some stuff into a phone. And um, one of which was this, reading this blog, the priest about a homeless guy. And, um, and then I got it in the studio and I, I just had Maxine's voice coming through the speakers, which is fantastic. Uh, I, I tell you, that's a great experience. Yeah. Cause she's so expressive and uh, distinctive sounding. And I just kept listening to this dialogue and I thought, okay, then this track started to emerge, which is not really like what my stuff's sort of known for. It's yeah. like, in a way it's almost like trip hop or something like that. Yeah. Right. And um, yeah, and then we made the, this little film that's on YouTube for anyone who's interested with uh, with Molly Windsor as uh, acting as this homeless girl. Yeah. So yeah, the the collaborations. Um, it was a good idea working with Maxine, and I'm really really looking forward to getting back to it. But she's, she, if anything, she works more than I do. You know. Yeah. I was going to say, do you consider yourself to be a workaholic? Yeah. You do. Yeah, I sort of. I think it's a little bit too late to deny that. Yeah. Do you ever get days where you just can't be arsed, so just get up and stay in your pajamas <laughs> playing Minecraft or something? <laughs> I, I always, I should, I should do that. Yeah, you should try it. Do you do Minecraft? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let me talk about the collaboration with Noel because you did a track with Noel on uh, his recent album, yeah. If Love Is the Law, and that not yeah. just the guitar on it, the, the mouth organ, harmonica. Yeah. How is your harmonica? <laughs> harmonica, the, she's fine. <laughs> the harmonica on that, it's like, it makes the ears go up on me, my arms like that. Yeah, well, I've got to, I mean, I played it, but Noel had the vision for that. Uh, you know, he, he was, that was that was his thing, bring your harmonica down for this. And then. You Did know, you say, how is your harmonica? Uh, Do you uh, uh, No, I no. didn't, but I'm going to from now on. Every time I hear that, I want to think of you. <laughs> Can you remember the last time I told you a joke? It's a bit, I didn't, I didn't make this joke up, it's out there, but it's. Um, was what, it the Marmite one? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. You, should, should you didn't know. invent that. I, don't. I didn't invent it. I'm just saying. I told, but when I told you, I don't think you knew it. No, I think that was the first time yeah. I ever heard it, and I've heard it a lot since then. Yeah. <laughs> For those that don't know, it, it's um, you asked me that you you uh, you set it up, and I'll give should you. do that. Yeah. Hey Johnny. No, I ain't got no. I guess it weird, doesn't it? Hey, hey, yeah, mate. What does Morrissey have on his toast? I don't know, but Johnny Marmite. See. It's good. Works it? every time. They're yeah. laughing out there in, uh, me, in Radio Land, what Twitter Land, whatever it's called. Um, yeah, so the Noel collaboration is amazing. And yeah. Any other collaborations lined up that you can talk about? Or is it all a bit secret at the moment? No, I haven't. Um, no, I haven't. I haven't got anything uh, in, on the horizon other than trying to get Maxine into the studio and myself and Maxine and work on that. Uh, no, I, I've sort of uh, over the last sort of, I guess six, seven years or whatever. I've, I've, uh, I keep coming back to Hans Zimmer. I worked on Noel's uh, on, on the album before this one as well, and um, and Pet Shop Boys as well, really. Yeah. Uh, so I think between Hans, the, the movies and Pet Shop Boys and Maxine, I'm really very, very lucky, extremely lucky, because they're all very uh, not only very inspiring people to work with. Uh, but uh, they're very different from my own solo stuff as well. Yeah. So, you know, I feel pretty, pretty colourful, lucky yeah. now, yeah. How many guitars have you got at the moment, Johnny? I've got fewer than I used to have, actually. Do you ever count them all? I think, oh, I've got 83. You never do that. Or whatever. I have done. The last time I counted was about, I mean, it's going to sound really gross, but it was about 115 or wow. something like that. Yeah, but over the years, in my defence, uh, when I bought loads, guitars were... They weren't called vintage guitars when I started buying loads of them. Right. They were just old guitars. Yeah, right. And then when the Smiths started making money, that was uh, that was what I spent my money on. Yeah. And books and sunglasses. Yeah. And drugs. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Saying nothing. Um, do you, when you're walking around the house, I've been, I always wanted to ask this. Do you ever just pick up a guitar and put it on and stand in front of a mirror and go, hey, look, <laughs> hey, look Johnny Marr. <laughs> because I would. If I was, I'd, be, I'd be walking around all the time as, as no, Johnny Marr would. to wife like that. I'd be like, that's why, yeah, Johnny Marr wants a brew. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder, do you never do that? Oh, so I, 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 I do the Clint Moon third person thing all the time in my life. I've heard that you do that, yeah, actually, Clint. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. the word is out that you yeah. do that. Yeah, Charlie tells yeah. everybody about that. Clint Moon really You can pull it off, that. though. Yeah. <laughs> Clint Moon really. <laughs> I better let you go anyway, but... Um, it's all right. I've, I could talk to you 
We always do, mate. For weeks no, on end, we, could, we might good. even touched on the book. How is Niall, your son, by the way? Is he still an incredible musician? Uh, thanks very much for asking. He's doing the second Man Made album in... Uh, he's doing it in Manchester, actually, in August, and then he's doing that. But at the moment, he's working with Hans Zimmer. Wow. Hans is just like, yeah, he's elbowed the old man out. Incredible. How old is he now, then, Niall? He's, he's 25. So about four or five years ago, he did a bit with Sheik, didn't he? He did, yeah. He's, he's named after Nile Rogers, isn't he, your, your lad? Yeah, he is, yeah. So I, I thought as a pinnacle of his life, that's going to be it, isn't it? Working with sheep, but no, Hans Zimmer. He, he, did, uh, he did Coachella with Hans. He took over the guitar. It wasn't actually my gig. He took over it. He took over the, the other guitar player, was is Mike Enzinger, who is the guitarist in Incubus. Wow. And Mike dropped out and um, Hans... Said, well, you know, I, I would have feel about asking about Niall doing it. I said, well, don't ask, you know, that's me. Ask, ask Niall, you know. So he, he was well up for it. So uh, yeah, he did Coachella last year, and uh, now he's you know he's doing movies with him now. Yeah, so he's doing he's doing great. But I, I think he's really eager to get Man Made going again. Yeah, and they're a real Manchester band, Man Made. Yeah, they're from they're from the Northern Quarter. Three piece band. Yeah, they they write and uh, exist. In the Northern Quarter, that's where Niall started at the night and day as a 15-year-old. Mm. And, um, you know, I mean, he went, I think he went to his first ever gig, I don't was his first gig, but anyway, I remember him going to see that band Ambulance, do you remember yeah. them? Yeah, 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 yeah. He went to see them when he was about 11, and I was like, what? And um, so, you know, he, he's sort of, he's, he's grown up in the, in the night and day. Yeah. Now. And they're a three-piece rock band, but they're nothing like a rock band because it's quite... Um, it's tunings. He's got weird, unusual tunings on his yeah. guitar. He sounds nothing like anything you've ever done, does he? No, it, no, it's not it, a my. It's a bit in a way. It's a little bit like. Um, it's not a million miles away from like, from I guess a bit of a supergrass kind of vibe, but a bit more American sounding. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's no coincidence that supergrass were a three piece and man made are a three piece. Yeah. That he's got that very outgoing. He sings a bit like that as well. I think he's good looking different. lad as well. You can. It, it, uh, it, if you sit by his mother. Yeah, it's you as well, mate. <laughs> okay. Right, listen, let's do this again in a few weeks because I've got all these Love other to. things that I wanted to talk about. Well, Love to. That can all wait. The gig is uh, the Apollo 18th of November um, and the album's beautiful. Call the Comets out now and the book. Get the book. It's a great read. I did read it. I, re- I read every bit of it. Um, yeah, thanks, man. And it finished. I finished reading it in November of... Uh, 2015. I'll tell you about that afterwards because it's not part of this interview. But uh, yeah, an amazing. Book. Thanks, Clint. Well, and, anyone who yeah anyone who comes to the Apollo, if you if you're sneaking in, you didn't hear it from me, and you have to be very very careful. Yeah, and uh, if you want any fake tickets, <laughs> Graham Lambert. We've got it. Let's let's move on. Johnny Marr, always a pleasure. See you in a bit, brother. brother. Thank you.